Here we go. A couple minutes past the top of the hour. Let's get started here. So thank you all for attending today. Um, we are very excited to give this presentation and a couple of housekeeping notes real quick, just to uh, make sure that everybody's set to um, mute your devices. I think we've already got mute set, but just to minimize any possibility of background noise, please mute your devices. Um, the other things we want to talk about are Q&A. So today we're not going to do an interactive session. This will be something where Lance and I are presenting, but we do want to hold questions um, to the very, very end. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and type those in the Q&A panel, and otherwise there will be an email address for each of us to be able to, to answer questions if you want to email those to us after the presentation. Um, but without further ado, let's, let's kick off here. So uh, Lance and I are very, very happy and very proud and, and very honored that you're uh, taking your time to, to spend with us today, having to go through uh, an understanding about some more of the digital marketing technology stack. And so I'm Sean Browning with Lytix. Lytix is a customer data platform. At least we fit in that category of customer data platform. It's, it's a kind of a buzzword that's occurred and, and gotten more popular over the last two years. Um, but we're striving for personalization uh, and orchestration um, for you know, right time, right message type of thing. But it really applies to what we have going on with Closed Loop. So Lytics and Closed Loop are partners. And so I'd also like to introduce Lance Loveday, the CEO of Closed Loop, and uh, give a little bit of background about his experience. Thanks, Sean. Lance Loveday here, CEO of Closed Loop. We are a pay-per-click agency, uh, and we've expanded out uh, beyond just pay-per-click and doing a fair amount of uh, paid social, display, programmatic, video, uh, and uh, other forms of what we think of as full funnel advertising campaigns, which we're gonna be talking about more today. And so let's, let's continue on with the idea of personalization. We know that as consumers throughout, throughout the globe, um, if, you know, if they see different ads of coupons of offers that they receive for discounts on something they just purchased, it's very frustrating. And it also leads to a lot of wasted ad spend, right? And that's the, that's the, the story that, that's been since the beginning of, of the web. And so the idea of knowing more about how do we understand the person behind the data, that's where I want to get started because it's moving away from cookies or at least being less dependent upon cookies and understanding more about the person behind the data. And so as Lytics says, a type of technology that figures out who the person is across devices, um, all of the activity that occurs, um, be it clicks or views or downloads or registrations or whatever are being compiled to understand more about the behavior and the activity for that consumer. Because what we're trying to do is get away from understanding clicks in history and getting more into understanding more about intent, the life cycle, right? What are the patterns and behavior that really help drive the understanding of the relationship for consumers? And so we add a little bit of intelligence to the behavior to really forecast and predict. It leads to good site personalization. We've got some use cases coming um, in a few more clicks. Um, but it leads to a better conversation through advertising, through social media, and so forth. Because when you start with an understanding of, hmm, I don't know who you are, then we crack open with a couple of beginning use cases. An unknown to known challenge. We serve a model. We don't know who you are, but if you tell us more, then we'll go ahead and, and serve you a custom offer or something that you're really interested in. But this really leads to, uh, that's why we're partnering with Closed Loop, improved ad efficiency increased site conversions, personalized engagement, because we know that engagement drives customer loyalty. With that information, we're pulling in all the different data sources. We wanna provide that full 360 degree view of your customer. Um, so we're pulling in offline data, online data, and all these different places to understand who is the person behind the data? Where are they located? What content do they have certain affinity with? Are they likely to purchase? Are they likely to be engaged or not likely to be engaged? And so you'll have a much better picture of who the person is behind the data so you can understand more about their life cycle and predict their patterns and serve them a more personalized experience. Customer data platforms typically do four things. I'm about to show six here in this build, but there's data collection. There's an online and an offline component. 
There is not beyond the data collection component. There's the part about identity resolution. Who is the person across devices? Understand the information, their attributes, build rule sets off of that. What is their interest? Are they a high, medium, low value consumer or customer? Are they new? Are they returning? Because you want to pivot and you want to change the conversation and personalize that based on the rules and the segmentation that is built. And then you want to get that to the external systems that a consumer might interact with, right? The experience layer. One thing about a customer data platform is should be agnostic, right? There are a number of, of organizations that say, yes, they have a customer data platform, but it only locks you into that particular vendor's stack. We take the opinion and the approach of being agnostic. So we already work with your selections that you've made for your investments in your digital marketing technologies, email, advertising, social media, analytics, and so forth. So for these four things here, these typically make up a customer data platform. However, beyond the typical customer data platform, Lytix is adding a layer of prediction and decisioning on top of that. We have data science already built in. We've had that built in since 2013. We have open capabilities and extensibility so that you can, as a consumer, as a customer, possess your own data, right? So as we have data and we're processing that dynamically, you can download that, you can process that, and you can also import your own custom algorithms if you would like. We also help with content optimization through web content management, um, social media, mobile, and the like. And there are ways of understanding more about the journeys of how people progress because as we're consuming those journeys and we're boiling down those common denominator variables, then we can predict and we can make recommendations to you and your marketing team about what are good next best steps, what are good next best offers. And that's where we get into your digital stack. What Lytics is doing as a customer data platform above and beyond any other data platform or customer data platforms are, we're adding the identity resolution and a predictive layer to your digital stack. So if you have offline and online data, kind of below the horizon of the dotted red line, you've got data in offline locations, cloud locations, mobile locations, maybe using a tag manager to collect data live and dynamically, then we are able to sit on top of that and anything else you might have, Tableau, Google, um, Microsoft, and so forth. But if we sit on top of that, then we're going to effectively try and be a part of your control tower situation. We can provide the identity resolution to understand who people are. We can understand the history in order to generate some of the insights and the commonalities. We'll apply data science to score people dynamically in order to then understand what they're likely to do, what is their propensity, are they likely to continue and be loyal? or are they likely to drop off? And so based on that, we can suggest next best experiences. Now, we're not, we're kind of a middleware. We're not the experience layer, right? We are leveraging all of the advertising, web and mobile and messaging experiences that would command and dictate that. So we are able to help define those segments, those audiences, and then do the real time decisioning so that the experience layer can then take effect a little bit more about the data science. Lytics um, is based on Google Cloud Platform. We have the AI and the ML already built in. Fancy terms for, for being able to understand a little bit more about the data. But if we take into account ideas about behavior, what is their intent, what are their patterns, then we're leveraging these types of models. Let me take Momentum, for example. If you think about a subscription service, a subscription service such as Netflix, Amazon, uh, Dollar Shave Club, Spotify, the list goes on, right? For clothing subscription, for household product subscriptions, for pet food subscriptions, we have a way of understanding the interaction and the engagement. We also calculate the momentum. So if we look at and think about a bell curve, right, where it's kind of larger in the, in the middle, we'll put the middle point there and then look at the score between zero and 100 with 50 being in the middle. If someone's momentum score is 50 or greater, that means that they are paying for the service and they are engaged. And if they're engaged, then you're able to say, oh, I see that Sean, you are 
you're paying for this Spotify subscription, for example, and maybe you would be interested in these additional features and functions. Momentum score helps you determine on an individual basis, which then you can group and build an audience, to figure out are they engaged? Because we know that if there is personalization, personalized offer drives engagement, engagement builds customer loyalty. And you want people to have their momentum score between 50 and 100. However, it's not a perfect world. There are scores between zero and 49. And so if you recognize the momentum score of someone paying for the service, however, they're at the lower end of the spectrum for the momentum, then they're not getting the value for what they're paying for. In which case, then you pivot and serve a different offer. And that different offer might be, hey, we recognize you're paying for the service, but you are not utilizing the service. How about if we give you three months for the price of two? Or you might also be interested in X or Y or Z. But the momentum score, and this is one of several, that is just an example to help understand and predict customers that are likely to churn. Wouldn't you like to know that? Who are those that are showing the signals that are likely to churn that need to be re-engaged or re-embraced? And we'll tell you that. Who are those that are likely to purchase, especially for cross sell upsell? If they've already got the recognition, right? They're already familiar with their brand. If you give them something to, to stay engaged, then they don't have to go anywhere else. So they're likely to purchase, likely to sign up, and ultimately, you want to grow them to have a high lifetime value. But we've got the scores. Intensity, what are they interested in? Frequency, how frequently are they here? Are they here in, you know, once a week on a scheduled basis and all of a sudden it spikes to be multiple times this week? Now you know you got them. Now you, you can seize that magic window of opportunity. And then you can determine and serve the next best offer. I have a case study here that I like to highlight about how this is being used in the real world. This is a, a Lytx customer. Nestle is the conglomerate, and this is Purina specifically. But as we tend to start with the first use case, what you might want to do is, is the anonymous to known use case. We don't know who people are on the first click or the first visit of a brand new device, for example. But we have the way of serving a modal and say, you know, we don't know who you are, but if you would like a custom offer or a certain discount, you know, something fill in the blank based on your, your business. We'll serve that modal. We'll request a little bit of information, a little give get, right? If they give us something, they get something in return. And then we know who they are. So an individual, which whom we might not know, uh, reveals herself to be Karina Velasco. Now we know a little bit more, right? So now it's a, it's a formula. It's a journey. Uh, it's a relationship over time. What more do we want to know? And so we might want to know more about content in the bottom right corner, the affinity, the understanding of what this person is interested in. And so what we recognize is the clicking on a website or through mobile content or email or advertising, we're understanding that Rena is interested in dogs, more specifically and appropriately puppies and golden retrievers in particular, right? And organic dog food. These are, these are points of context that we can leverage to be very precise in our personalization. And so when we know more about the content and we, put, and we position that and pair that with the person, now we have a very compelling exercise about knowing the who and the what. Who Karina is and what she's interested in. It's not, it's not cats and birds and snakes and fish, it's puppies, right? And so as we build this on, we'd say, hey, you, know, you might want to have um, you know, some access to our mobile app. And so, so Purina purchased Petfinder as an app and a business. And so now they're able to engage with the pet's life cycle. But also there is in our, you know, I'm, I'm up in Beaver, Beaverton, Oregon, the land of Nike and Intel and Columbia Sportswear and so forth. And we're on the Pacific Coast, just like, um, just like Lance is. And I just want to put a, a note out there that we are feeling for you for anybody that's affected by the forest fires that are occurring and, and things that are going on. Hope everything turns out well for you. But that relates to kind of the pet finder. As people are affected by fires, or maybe there's hurricanes in Florida, there are pets that get displaced, and Pet Finder is a way to, to help find homes for pets. So they could then serve an offer to Karina and say, hey, Karina, we know that you have a puppy. Maybe you have room for one more. And so they know the right time to send you know, that just right message based on the day and the time that you see those bubbles there on the graph to know when the right message is to serve the right offer or the right detail so that we can say, oh, Karina's most active between 11 and 12 on weekdays, great, that's the right time to interact. And we feel in our opinion, 
the website, the website should be on the same page as well as all of the marketing, the content, the email and the display advertising, right? So with a customer data platform, especially in a predictive capacity, when you know the what and the who, you can personalize the content. And what this organization's found is this is absolutely 100% building customer loyalty. When it is time to make that decision, you know exactly what decision these people are making. So th this is very effective, it's very efficient, it is very uh, powerful, and these are insights to understand more about the intent, the life cycle, the patterns of users' behavior, to automate. Right? You don't wanna put a person at a keyboard to make this occur. We're making this happen in an automated fashion for the next best experience deciding what would be that particular thing to serve to an individual. And the machine learning is continually evaluating all of these details to make custom predictions, generate those insights to deliver a very compelling engagement solution for understanding who is the person, what content are they interested in, and then once they make that purchase or download or subscription, how do we pivot to turn to something else to keep that individual engaged with new content and new offers and so forth. So with Lytics and closed loop, what you get is a unified customer data set. We bring in the offline, we bring in the online. As people are moving through the process of understanding their audience, running that through display advertising, it does bring around full closed loop, right? See what I did there? It does bring around the closed loop situation to bring that back into Lytics to reprocess dynamically to give you those actionable insights to understand more about the life cycle of your consumer, understand their patterns, and then deliver that across the channel, right? So across your investments that you've already made for your digital marketing stack, we want to make sure that they're all interacting and firing in a uniform capacity. So the cross channel orchestration is what you get with the power of Lytics and closed loop combined. And from here, there are more particulars and specifics that Lance has that we'd like to, to hand over to Lance. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and I'll pass it over to you, Lance. Fantastic, thanks, Sean. My pleasure. Beautiful summary. Um, uh -oh. Looks like it's not gonna let me share. Uh, got host yeah. screen sharing. You want me to flip mine back on? Would you mind? Thanks. Absolutely. Appreciate it, Sean. My pleasure. No. No webinar is complete without a, a technical hangup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you wouldn't mind driving. Yeah, my pleasure. Let me bring that back up here momentarily. Thanks, Sean. Um, really um, have been a fan of what Lytics has been doing for uh, a while. And, uh, you know, for us, um, you know, we work on the more on the advertising side and, and we've faced this conundrum that, that Sean talked about. Um, uh, you're not uh, displaying yet. I'm seeing the uh, Catalina Island there. Very good. Three, um, two, three. It's, it's locked in uh, full screen mode and I got to get it out of full screen to then share. Well, there we go. Gotcha. Here we go. I've got, I've got Catalina again. I'm with you. Which is a beautiful place. <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> but we, we've faced this, this problem of, you know, how do we take that, that idea of having a known and an unknown audience out there? And how do we better target ads to people that we know at least something about? Um, and, and that is something we've had to do semi-manually over time and we've used things like keywords and we've used some you know basic signals like demographics and so on um and it's it's been um successful for us but we've been kind of waiting for more ai and machine learning driven segmentation to come along to help power uh, a lot of that targeting capability all right you're broadcasting thanks okay, fantastic there we go Good. um um and, and so we're excited to now kind of leverage the best of both worlds in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the strategic insights that, that we can bring as advertising practitioners with the great machine learning capabilities that a platform like Lytics can bring to bear. And uh, if we can bring those together, uh, as we're gonna talk about, well, we're gonna be set up for success. So by way of background on closed loop, again, we are a digital advertising agency. Um, 
we have worked with a variety of clients, B2C and B2B, uh, some of whom will let us publish uh, some of the metrics that we've driven for them, some of whom won't uh, in the lower right there. Uh, some of the, the more recognizable brands are a little more skittish uh, about letting us share results. Um, but uh, I share this uh, not to beat our own chest, but to demonstrate that we have been around for quite a while um, and, and hopefully to express that we at least have some idea of what we're doing and that we're, we're working with major brands and driving pretty high levels of growth for what are already, in most cases, pretty mature campaigns. And I'm going to talk about, you know, how we're able to, to do that uh, coming up here. Um, if we go to the next slide, you know, I've been struck by some of the commentary recently about how we've crammed so much digital growth into such a short period of time as a result of this pandemic. Um, but the, the stat that really jumped out to me as a, a data-driven person is this idea that e-commerce doubled from Q1 to Q2 as, as measured by the, uh, the Commerce Department. And, I, and they may have a broad definition, but that, that just struck me. The idea that e-commerce doubled <laughs> quarter over quarter, mm -hmm. holy cow. So, you know, I, I know that I don't have to tell anyone in this audience about why digital is important, but it has only gotten that much more important. And, and we're seeing the same thing, quite honestly, on, on the B2B side as well. So it's not just retail that's impacted by this. The trends have been accelerated on the B2B side with the loss of uh, event marketing and, and some other channels as well. So the, the key theme, if we go to the next slide, is that I want to leave you with is that audience targeting in 2020 is kind of where keyword targeting and you know, paid search was in 2004, right? It was this new unproven thing. People weren't sure this was going to really have legs, you know, and since then it's kind of, you know, eaten the advertising industry and, you know, to the point where it's, it's kind of peaked arguably. And now we're looking for that next form of targeting. And, and I'm here to tell you that that audience targeting is it, and uh, it's it's pretty exciting. Um, so if audience targeting is the thing, the way that we're gonna target ads strategically from this point forward, um, next slide. Um, you know, I, I wanna leave you with the, the message too, that you, you can now deploy full funnel ad campaigns, and you can leverage your first party data, you know, from Lytics, for example, to power a lot of these things. So what, what does that look like? Well, we actually uh, did an audit for uh, a client this week, um, or a prospective client, and we got under the hood with their campaigns. And everyone's talking about this audience targeting, but we're still shocked at how few people are actually doing it. And so uh, we, if we look at the next slide, look at, what forms of audience targeting was this client? And this is a sophisticated Silicon Valley unicorn <laughs> client, and they were only doing two of these forms of audience targeting that you can do across, uh, you know, if we think about these, this full funnel ad strategy. And they were kind of surprised themselves because, you know, they thought they were doing pretty well at it. But when we looked under the hood, the, the reality was, was far different. And I think this is representative of most advertisers, even more sophisticated advertisers, uh, which is somewhat surprising, but it, I think, speaks to the opportunity that's available to those who, that are, are willing to really jump in and take advantage of this, because it really is kind of a greenfield opportunity now. And I'm going to get, um, I'm going to show you some specifics of how to, to leverage some of these capabilities uh, coming up here. But, um, oh, we got the mind mill going. Beautiful, Sean. Um, if, if we think about how you can use Lytics to power your ad campaigns, um, obviously, you know, what Lytics can do is power, you know, what we think of as your deeper funnel audience segments. And specifically, that's for our purposes uh, on, on Google, for example, it's similar audiences and remarketing. Lytics will create automatic segments powered by their AI to populate those for you. And they'll keep them automatically, those lists, they'll keep those lists uh, populated for you automatically. It's freaking brilliant. Like I said, we've been waiting for this uh, and we're so excited that it's here now. And what we realized is that we could actually do a lot more with that if we took this full funnel approach. And so if, uh, if we go to the next slide, what we thought about was, you know, what if we could use those segments 
and extract the intelligence from those and analyze it to help power our mid funnel and top of funnel campaigns. And, and beyond that, what if we could find the correlations between these different types of targeting and, and then the correlations to high value leads as well? And to do that, you've got to have uh, another technology layer. Uh, and we've built one, we call it Forager, if we go to the next slide. If you think of uh, Lytics, obviously, as your, your customer data platform, you can think of uh, this layer as being kind of an advertising data platform. And it integrates with Lytics uh, and other systems, um, but it's, it's more ad-centric. And so what we have built with this Forager tool is a platform that pulls data in from all the ad platforms. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we normalize it so that we can do cross-platform analysis. Very importantly, blend it with your backend data. That is Lytics, your, your CDP, and your CRM, maybe your lead scoring data. And then we export it to a business intelligence tool. We, we like to use Tableau. You can use whatever tool you want. Um, and at that point, you've got full funnel visibility into how all of your paid channels are performing. And it's incredibly powerful to have that. If we go to the next slide, you know, we then have the best of all worlds because we get to power, we, we control the data sources. We've got more and more granular data than most advertisers have. And we've got this really powerful BI tool to run custom queries and analysis uh, against so that we can understand correlations at a deeper level than most advertisers can. If we go to the next slide, um, what it really enables is the ability to find where the most valuable traffic is. And what we're finding is that the most valuable traffic from an ad perspective is coming now in the intersections between these different forms of targeting. And what we do with foragers, we suss that out and we find these veins and then we really aim to improve the economics for those rich veins. And when we do that, that allows us to expand out into the adjacent opportunity space, which we show in the next slide. And so what we find is that that adjacent opportunity space that gets opened up when we refine the economics is it sometimes even bigger than that initial vein that we uncover. And, that, and that's kind of how we rationalize how we can grow lead or sales volume and improve ROI at the same time, because those things usually are, are, are in conflict, right? It's, there's usually a trade-off between volume and ROI. What we're finding is when you really play this game smart, you don't have to make that trade-off and you, you can actually kind of defy the laws of economics. So let me make that real for you. Uh, if we go to the next slide and, and we think about a full funnel advertising strategy, uh, and, and we're going to make this specific to Google, for example. We talked, you know, at the bottom of the funnel down there about how you can use Lytics to power your similar audience and remarketing campaigns at the bottom of the funnel. We wanted to work backward and say, all right, well, what can we learn from those segments that Lytics created for us that could power our upper funnel campaigns. And so in the case of Google, they've got in-market targeting. They've got custom interest, affinity segment targeting, and then at the, at the highest level, demographic. And when you do that, when you power your campaigns with this uh, form of audience targeting, now all of a sudden you're weighting your spend to audiences that you do know at least something about. And, and the impact of that is huge. But again, few people are doing it. So uh, let me go a level deeper, make this totally real for you. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you know, this is a screenshot from the, the Google Ads interface of what the in-market audience look like. And I want to move up the funnel here. So step one, we're starting with in-market audiences. Uh, and these are audiences that Google has created on their own. Um, and you can see some examples reflected here. And they'll show you for your own campaigns how these audiences index for you. And if they index highly, great. That's good intel for you to know. It shows you the audience size. And then you've got what you can do is enable those audiences and you put them in what they call a observation mode. So all you have to do literally is check the box at this point and hit OK. And 
Google will start amassing performance data on how these audiences perform for you. It's, it's freaking brilliant. It costs you nothing, but you do have to enable it. So that's step one, set up these in-market audiences. Those are people who are already raising their hand via their behavior and all the signals that Google is able to pick up and parse are already saying they might be in market for these different products or services. Next step up the funnel, set up your custom intent audiences. This is super interesting and really underutilized. Uh, I really encourage people to take advantage of this. So say for example, you have some intelligence from Lytics that you've got a high proportion of your audience that are pet lovers in the example that, that Sean referenced. Well, you can create a, set, a custom segment for pet lovers here and say, all right, I want to uh, target my ads to people who search, uh, who visited maybe these other sites, websites that are representative of people who are you know, really into their pets, or maybe they searched on given keywords in, the, in their search history that indicate that they are pet lovers. You can, and, and, and it, I mean, that's just one example. We, in some cases, have created tens or, or hundreds of custom segments uh, in, using this tool, and it's, it's tremendously valuable. And we were able to come up with the ideas in the segmentation scheme, leveraging the data from Lytics and the segments that they created. So that's the next one, set up your custom intent audiences. Step three, these affinity audiences. Next step up the funnel, these again are pre-built audiences that Google has created. I, they'll show you the same info um, as to how you're indexing uh, as they do for the in-market audiences. Um, and all you have to do is check the box again and add it and you'll start getting performance data on those things. Um, this is just, you know, broad categories, uh, but can be very, very helpful. Um, step four, then, this is when it gets fun, is when you start looking at, you start amassing that performance data and starting to compare how these different audiences perform over time. You, in this example, you might look at the, the second to last column, the cost per conversion column, and, and you might be surprised at the variance in performance, one audience to the next, if that's your, your metric, right? You've got a huge range here from 15 bucks to you know, $180 cost per lead. So now that you've got statistically significant data coming in on how these audiences perform, now it gets really interesting. You go to step five here, now you have the ability to apply bid modifiers and bid up or down audience by audience based on the value that that audience drives for you. It's, uh, it's just game changing. And so in this example, you know, someone who visits the all product page, the remarketing audience, um, based on their behavior, we're gonna bid up 35% and apply that to all of our ad groups uh, that we had to gray out here for the confidentiality for this client. Um, Whereas uh, a, a, uh, an affinity audience, um, people who are employed by the healthcare industry, we're gonna bid up 27%. You take that same thought process, you apply it to every audience and you start weighting your spend to where you're seeing value and it changes your ROI and your, your results from these campaigns dramatically to do that. Um, if, uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll give you a tip on this. What's really cool is, is if you, there are likely to be audiences that are not valuable to you as well, and you do have the opportunity to completely exclude those audiences. And the, the way you do it is you apply a, a negative 100% bid modifier for those audiences that are not driving value for you. And, and what's super cool is you can do that even if you're using Google's smart bidding, that is their machine learning based uh, bidding mechanism. Um, so it's, you truly can have the best of all worlds. You can use you know, this highly sophisticated machine learning based um, bid algorithms on the one hand, and you can carve out audiences that are less valuable to you. Um, where does that come in handy? Well, you might be targeting a B2B audience and, who, and you might have a lot of keywords that you want to target, but that are also used a lot by consumers and you'd want to 
minus out all the, that consumer traffic, this is one way you can do it. Uh, it's, it's just game changing. It allows you to bid on head terms that otherwise might soak up all your budget, uh, driving poor quality traffic. Now you can X all that out and weight your budget to where you truly are seeing value. It's, it's just, it's a big deal. It's almost totally underutilized uh, and, and it's just been game changing for us. So that's super pro tip one. Number two on the next slide is each of these audiences has an idea associated with it that uh, Google designates and you can actually pass that through as a parameter through to your CRM and your CDP and associate that with the customer record so that now you're, you're actually able to tell what audience Google is putting that user into as well to you know, give you that much more of a fully fleshed out view of them. And then from, for our you know, selfish purposes from an ad management perspective, we're able to do full funnel optimization based on that as well. And we can start to bid and weight budget to traffic sources that are not just driving a lower cost per lead, but a lower MQL, lower SQL, and, and ultimately hopefully to lifetime value. Um, game changing, really, really significant. Um, and the way that, that that looks, you know, you've got to stitch all the data streams together. Um, you pass these parameters through sometimes in, in just in the URL itself, and then it gets associated with the customer record uh, in this example in Salesforce, and then that would flow through to the, the CDP uh, as well. Um, totally doable, something we do for all of our clients now is it's kind of foundational to our ability to be successful, um, but a little, little bit geeky. Um, but we're, we're, we, we're continually surprised how few people have had the discipline to actually do this, um, even though it's a big deal. So once you do all that, what do the results look like? On the next slide, here's a case study. Um, and we, I was just so pleasantly surprised that the way that the cost per lead metric came out actually mapped to exactly what we would have expected. The real world almost never works the way you expect it to, right? <laughs> the way it should academically. But in this case, the audience performance uh, mapped to the funnel almost perfectly. Um, and that was a really validating sign for us by itself. More significantly, we actually drove the cost per acquisition cost down. And we, in terms of traffic quality, we more than doubled the conversion rate from the traffic that we were getting from this campaign. From, and we did that by layering on these forms of audience targeting on top of our existing Google campaigns. Um, just, just totally game changing, uh, as I talked about. Um, so that's one hopefully very specific example of how you can leverage the unique targeting capabilities in Google to layer on this audience targeting. You can do that for other channels, but they're structured differently. And so on the next slide, you know, we, we show you how you, how you, we think about doing that for Facebook and we take a similar approach for the other platforms, but th those are the big two uh, for most of our clients. Um, and, you know, again, we just reverse engineer the intelligence from what Lytics has told us about the, the segments that are most valuable to us already. And then we use that intelligence to power these different forms of targeting uh, as we move up the funnel. I'm, I'm not going to get as geeky on all these examples, but it, you know, um, the point is to follow that same thinking, that same methodology for each channel. And um, it's, it, you know, you're, you're, gonna, you're almost guaranteed to increase your ROI. Um, quick results that we saw from uh, doing the same thing for Facebook on the next slide. Um, the results are even more dramatic. We dropped cost per lead by 80%. Um, for high value leads, we dropped the cost per lead by, by 50%. And then overall, our lead volume increased at the same time. Again, you shouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> but, but when you're really playing this game smart, you can. It's representative of, of really what's possible out there. Um, also, when we're combining the CDP data with the, the ad intelligence data, what we can do now is we can start to optimize on the next slide to non-traditional metrics, right? You, you wouldn't think of uh, using Google and Facebook, for example, to be able to optimize to lead quality, or in this case, uh, as indicated by company size, right? This, this client 
came to us and they wanted to go up market. They wanted more large company leads. And so because we had all this data instrumented, we were able to actually use that as an optimization lever. And over time, what you see uh, on the next slide here, it's even clearer that we were able to increase the percentage of larger company leads and how this company measured lead quality by 50% uh, over time. And what happened is the sales force all of a sudden now, instead of not liking those you know, web sourced leads, realized they, they were actually pretty good. Um, and so the reputation of, of this lead source changed. The reps start working the leads that much harder. Our close rates increase. Now our ROI looks even better on a full funnel basis. Now we can afford to bid that much more for the traffic and we get into this virtuous cycle. That's how you play the game smart. And um, it's representative uh, of the opportunity, I think. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you know, um, that was kind of the big picture view for this client. We, I think we 6 x their lead flow over this, you know, roughly two year period while actually decreasing their cost per lead and increasing their lead quality. That's what success looks like. That's how you know when you're really playing this game smart and how you're leaving your competitors scratching their heads as to, to how you're doing it. So to summarize, the big three, in my view, on the next slide, it's, you know, start with your first party data. Use Lytics to leverage that data to create your bottom of funnel audience segments. Uh, it works beautifully. It, it delivers on the promise of, of machine learning. Um, next up, though, use some human intel to reverse engineer those segments a little bit and map them to the audience targeting capabilities of the different ad platforms to power your mid funnel and top of funnel audience segments. And then lastly, deploy, test and optimize those campaigns um, to deeper funnel KPIs and not settling for that, you know, superficial, you know, front end cost per lead or cost per sale metric. You do those things, you're going to be playing at a completely different level than 90% of your competition out there. And, um, uh, you're going to run circles around them. So that's really the, the meat of, uh, of my presentation. Uh, I, I do have a, an offer. Uh, just published a new book, uh, Average is Losing, um, and would love to offer you a free copy of that. Uh, if you go to the URL displayed here, uh, I'd be happy to send you a free copy of the book. Uh, with everyone working at home, uh, uh, <laughs> I figure it's better to ask for shipping addresses because I don't know where to send the darn thing. Um, but uh, we'd be, again, more than happy to send you a free copy um, if you want to head there to sign up for that. And with that, I just want to say thank you to Sean. Uh, and uh, I think we're ready for, for some q and So I think so. You know, there's, um, this is a very nice pairing together, right? When you're talking about data, uh, a lot of the questions that come, come across typically are, hmm, cookies. You know, what, what, I thought third party cookies are going away. Well, yeah, potentially, but cookies can still be first party data, right? So between closed loop and analytics for a lot of the display advertising data, those are cookies, but, but that is uh, first party data. And, you know, as third parties are, uh, third party cookies and third party data are continually being blocked, right? Think about Safari and, and Apple and Google and so forth. Um, now is the right time to, to take action and start collecting and gathering your data. So you can do that bottle of fun, uh, bottom of funnel analysis and work your way up. So, so this is a great solution, uh, a pairing and, and some tips and tricks about how to leverage your first party data in order to activate that and then um, take action and, and be, be the pros that we're going to beat your competition because these are some spectacular tips um, that we provided yeah. that would be able to go to the next level, yeah. Yeah, you bring up a great point, Sean. I mean, we're, we're seeing more and more clients um, really starting to get nervous and, and a little fearful about how they're going to um, how they're going to deal with a post cookie world because that you know that that window is starting to close on us um, and and using data in this way that we're talking about really is the the first step and it's a pretty big step um, towards starting to resolve that problem and, and the people who start solving for that now and leverage this not just for better ad targeting and, and, and ad ROI, um, you're just gonna be so much further ahead of the game um, when addressing that issue, because I, I, I think it is gonna catch a lot of organizations flat-footed. Agreed, agreed. Um, and another topic that comes up frequently um, that you were highlighting there, Lance, was 
you know, the, the dramatic um, conversion rate that's occurring because of these COVID times, right? There's, there's the, the patterns in the behavior uh, as people are at home and they're having to cook more, um, they're having to do more online shopping um, and so forth. So we find that there are particular sectors of the economy that are, that are performing really, really, really well. And then some, not so much, right? We're not doing so much travel and hospitality and <laughs> Uber and airplane travel and so forth. So we are seeing that there are sectors of the economy that um, our customers are pivoting towards and, and, and sometimes away from, right? So they're kind of leaving the old think behind and re, I don't know, kind of like re, re, being, being reborn like a phoenix, right? To, to re-strategize um, where do we need to go from here looking forward? Because we don't know how long this is going to last. But to pivot like that and, and engage those sectors of the economy that are thriving, they're out there. And um, so we're noticing a lot of our customers are saying, okay, we need to go this different direction and change tack. Um, what, what are you seeing on your side, Lance? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We're, we're seeing similar patterns play out. And, you know, what, what struck me, and I, I didn't speak to this before, but that, about that, that Department of Commerce statistic about mm -hmm. e-commerce essentially doubling quarter over quarter, um, a lot of the research is showing, too, that, that that's not a temporary phenomenon. Mm -hmm. you know, it's that these these are behaviors that are likely to persist. Um, you know, I think it was 73% of people plan to keep doing things the same way, even once this pandemic comes to an end, right? So um, this is a very real shift on the part of, I, I think, not just consumer behavior, but I think on, on, on business behavior, too, um, that, you know, that there has been this massive inflection point that you know we're arguably still in the middle of here um but it's it's not coming back uh yeah. the other way you know this this pendulum is not going to swing back uh, the other way I mean, I mean it may modulate somewhat but it's uh this is going to be um really a kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity for a lot of industries a lot of uh, a lot of organizations and those that have the the courage and the discipline to act on it now um are, are going to be able to really outpace the competition. So yeah, we're seeing all kinds of opportunities open up uh, for organizations to think differently. And even some that were really nervous about this and worried about survival early on are, are saying, holy cow, you know, we thought with events going away that we were just going to be dead in the water because we've been so reliant on that in the past, but we've managed to replace it with virtual events, with some other offers, other, uh, other types of things. And oh my gosh, we wish we'd done this two years ago because it's so much more efficient and it works better actually. It's true. It absolutely does. And, um, and we just got a question from Callie asking um, at what point does someone want to use a technology like Lytics being a customer data platform and, and aggregating your data. Um, what we find is, is customers that are looking to us and, and our business is split. You know, we talked about B2B and B2C our business is split about uh, two thirds B2C and one third B2B. Um, but when it becomes a kind of a daunting task of trying to, to coordinate all of your different investments in your different marketing technology um, in, your, in your MarTech stack, right? So you've got your social media, display advertising, email, and website. Typical for starting point and it just becomes too cumbersome making changes and it's taking more time than it should. Um, when someone recognizes that becomes a time challenge, not necessarily a money challenge, but just, just time, you're having to throw more people at the solution. That's when you want to start looking at, at looking at a CDP that will aggregate your data, process that dynamically, and then coordinate all of your MarTech investments that you've made. So we find customers are looking at, well, you know, if you're a smaller business, that might not make a lot of sense. If you're a, a medium sized to larger business where you're having to throw more people at the challenge because success is continuing upon itself and growing to propagate more success, that's when you're going to need to look at a CDP because then you have more data sources and data sets to pull in the mix, right, in a closed loop fashion to pull in the data, to aggregate that, to act on that, to understand the people behind the scenes in order to personalize that experience to drive that customer loyalty. So, um, so Callie, when does someone get into a CDP? Probably 
when your your business is a, a mid size to large size um, organization or, or enterprise that um, no longer can you throw people at the challenge. You really need to have a technology to integrate. And so one thing that um, and Lance would agree with this is a fast time to value. You want to do some things that are quick hit, quick value that you can you can do now that will um, impact your bottom line, right? So as you, you want to have more people come in the top of the funnel, as you know who those people are in the middle and you're coordinating that activity and then feeding them back into the top of the funnel, there are some things that closed loop analytics can do that would, if you can set a JavaScript tag um, on your website, then you would be able to see in a matter of days, like between five and seven days, some of those quick hits that would impact your social media and display advertising, because that's where we start for our initial use cases. To affect that, to drive conversion, um, you know, people coming in to, to do what you want them to do for subscribing a newsletter, watching a video, making a purchase or registration. Uh, but it also, to, to Lance's point, drops your cost per acquisition, increases your conversion to, you know, what, what happens if you change it from two to two and a half percent or three to three and a half percent? That really makes a big impact. Um, but we have some tips and tricks that get you going out of the gate very quickly. Um, we've got a, an organization in Salt Lake City where they were able to put their tag on day one. We saw results in seven days and they had ad suppression and personalization targeting within 21 days. Um, and they were seeing some dramatic increases in revenue and conversion that um, might not be typical. However, does kind of highlight the fast time to value. We can move as fast as customers can move um, to really drive success. So I wanted to highlight that, but yep, mid-size to enterprise would be the right size for someone looking for a CDP. Follow-up question for you, Sean. I mean, how do you guys address clients that you know really have more of an ABM focus? You know, mm -hmm. and, um, I, I, I know it's it's doable, but it's it, it's got to have some unique components for you. It really um, does. You know, I know what we do on the ad side, but I'm curious how, how you address it from a CDP perspective. We are looking for people, but rolling them up into their organization. So for account-based marketing, um, you know, we, we have customers, Tableau is a customer, interestingly enough, uh, Atlassian. There are a number of, of businesses that are targeting other businesses or other accounts. And what we're doing is we're associating and understanding who those individuals are by their, their email addresses, right? Atlytics.com, at closedloop.com. And we're associating those individuals so that when we wanted to target an, uh, an account, then we can get into the data and then understand who are those people in that account so that we can target those people through LinkedIn or through Facebook or through uh, Google advertising. So you can't target an organization necessarily, but you could target the people in the organization. So for account-based marketing, we do a couple of things. First is we've got an identity graph that does an account roll up of who the people are in their account. Um, so that we can say, target that account, give me all of the people underneath of that. We want to make sure all the data we provide is open and, and ob obtainable. And then secondarily, we've got that roll up capability. So um, you can see who those people are. You can drill into that information and expand each organization, each account, and see the people that are inside of that. So you can then target those individuals appropriately. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, if we're doing our job from an ABM advertising perspective you know we're especially leveraging say linkedin to target the those same people that work at those accounts we can turn them from known to unknown by driving traffic you know to the site and then, and then once they do you know they're gonna they're gonna show up in lytics and and we'll we'll take them from from unknown to known associated with that organization um for for remarketing purposes from that point on Exactly. Exactly. And then, and then with that understanding, you know, it's an ongoing journey. You're not going to know everything just in the first minute or the first hour, but over time, as we have this relationship with these organizations, these accounts or these, these individuals, this information, this history, we're not an analytics tool that's trying to derive history and account for the history, but we're using it to, to understand more about the intent of those consumers or that account or the, where they are in their life cycle and what are the patterns in behavior so that we can really start forecasting where we want to be. Like Gretzky used to say, you're going to skate where the hockey puck is going to be. 
Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you can really uh, take action appropriately. So. Brilliant. All right. Well, I think we're about coming up on time. Um, yep, we're out of questions as well. So um, as a follow up, anybody has got uh, questions for Lance over at Closed Loop, you see his email address below. Any questions you might have for a CDP for Lytx particularly, please reach out to me. There's my email address there on the screen. And uh, really wanted to thank everybody on the line for taking your time to spend with us today to understand more about particulars of, of what you need to do for display advertising and how you work at the bottom of the funnel, apply that to the top of funnel and, and build that closed loop. Very nice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lance. This has been fun. We'll have to do this again. I look forward to it. Thank you, Sean. Been an absolute pleasure. And thanks to everyone for attending. Take care, all. Thanks, all.